Well, um, my, my task, my main task this, this morning, I think, is to introduce myself. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm here to introduce the first speaker, and I am the first speaker. So anyway, I am Alexander Brody. I uh, am a, a philosophy professor with a very lively interest in the history of philosophy and particularly a lively interest in relations of a philosophical nature between uh, Scotland and uh, France. And that's really what's, what we are going to be about, um, discussing relations of a philosophical nature between Scotland and France during um, a very long period, um, let's say uh, 1200, um, into the, comfortably into the 20th century. And during this period, uh, all sorts of philosoph philosophical schools have come and gone. What we are going to be focusing on, however, is um, especially re relations with existentialism, existentialist ideas, the idea of existence, the different modes of existence, that different things have, and particularly the mode of existence of persons and uh, the life of the mind. And <coughs> S Scottish philosophers have been interested, have worked in this field for centuries and centuries. And I might just note, I think in anticipation of some things that are likely to be said, um, uh, by, uh, by Dr. Tonner, I don't know. Uh, th there is a most interesting relationship between uh, the Scottish philosopher uh, David Hume and uh, several of the existentialist school in uh, France across the middle of the 20th century. It's well worth pursuing. The impact of Hume on 20th century Scottish philosophy, I think, was, was quite profound as indeed the interest in Hume's Scottish opponents was no less profound in France in the 19th century, though that's a story that's not being told uh, nearly as much or nearly as well. I don't know how far back the story of Scotland and France in the philosophical field can go. I myself have been able to take it back to the 12th century. So I don't want to say more than a few words about this. There is uh, a great French philosopher theologian, uh, Richard de Saint-Victor, who I thought was really one of the great early French uh, philosophers and philosopher theologians until I decided one day I would read him. And the first thing I noticed was the name that he used for himself, <coughs> which is Ricardus de Sancto Victori, Scotus. He identified himself in his own writings to the rest of the world as a Scot. Now, there are people, and I swear they are all paid for by the Irish Tourist Board, who claim that the word Scotus actually meant you came from Ireland. And this is perfectly true for the 9th century, and to a certain extent to the 10th century. But by the 12th century, I can assure you, there are what are known as priest lists held in the Vatican Library with thousands and thousands of names of priests and where they come from. And there is a very clear distinction there. You will see Ricardo Scotus, um, Thomas Scotus, uh, Guglielmo Scotus, and you will see Ricardo Hibernicus, uh, Thomas Hibernicus, Guglielmo Hibernicus. A very clear distinction is already being made between those who are from Scotland and they, are no, they take the name Scotus 
and those who are from Ireland who are described as uh, Hibernicus, <coughs> Irish. <coughs> so here we have the, this first um, really major uh, French philosopher theologian, Richard de Saint Victor, who turns out to be a Scot after all, and not just any old Scot. Um, he, he was a, a, a major figure in one of the great early movements of the church, namely the Franciscans. He was a man who thought that it's love that makes the world go round, that the, that the creation was, was done as an act of love. And this is a, a, a divine love for the created world and that we are required to live in imitation of this act, so we are required to love, to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. This should be um, our mode of being um, as, as, as creatures, as, as created beings. And this was taken up by the Franciscans from the start that nature is worthy um, of, our, of our stewardry and of our love nature and the things of nature and this was all this is worked out in great detail by the um, by the the Scottish philosopher theologian uh, Richard of St. Victor St. Victor because um, he was at, he lived uh, in in Paris when, while he was in France in the uh, Abbey of St. Victor duly taken up and amongst those who were hugely influenced by his teachings, um, there was one in particular who, who has already been mentioned several times, and that is Duns Scotus himself, who was born in the village of uh, Duns in, in the Scottish border, borderlands. And um, he obviously showed tremendous uh, promise as a, as a child and was taken down to England by two Franciscans and he became a, a teacher in the University of Oxford and he went on to be a, um, <coughs> a teacher in the University of Paris where he stayed for a, a, a number of years, um, the better part of a decade and in a way philosophy Philosophy has been living in the shadow of Scotus since Scotus himself spoke. That's my view. Certainly had a vast influence, which I think is ongoing on Scottish philosophers even now. But I can certainly take the story well into the 20th century. And though I wish to, I, I wish to take it no further in public, and I've said that in public, that's because I don't want to spend too much time commenting on my colleagues in case they kill me. So, um, across the whole range of philosophy, uh, metaphysics, philosophy of mind, uh, moral philosophy, we find scotistic ideas at work. The, he was the great philosopher of existence of the Middle Ages, focused uh, with, with a greater subtlety, with a greater power, I would say, on the question of what it is for something to be and the different ways in which things can be and the way a human being can be as compared with the way, with the way in which something in the natural order but not, not the human order can be. What is it that when we ascribe being, what are we doing when we ascribe being to a being and what is it that all beings have in common that entitle us to think of them all under that same one heading of being or to be this was one of his great fields and what was special most special for as far as he was concerned about human beings was the fact that we human beings are free beings We live into the future as we live into the past and when we move forward we take the past with us and, but we are always going somewhere. Our, we, 
we make changes in the world, and these changes are intentional. It is according to our intention that things happen in the way in which they do. So our conception of, of the future is already driving us. Uh, we've got a certain conception of causality as something that comes from behind and propels something forward. The main conception that he had of causality is actually the opposite. It's the way the, the, future, in, the future exerts a causal influence on the present through our conception of the way that things could be if we exert ourselves in that direction. So we, we form a conception of the way that things could be. We attach a value to that conception and we then seek to embody that conception in our actions. So that when we, when we move into the future, well, <coughs> and it becomes present for us. We are already feeling at home in it. And the reason we feel at home in it is that we created it. This is from us. It's not from somewhere else. Okay? So the world, the world is already ours because we are free agents. And we really are free. And insofar as we, I, I offer a definition of freedom just now, <coughs> I haven't done so yet, but I'm, I'm going to move in that direction. It's because of some things that I want to say in the future, that's to say in five or 10 or 15 minutes about Scotland and the way Scottish philosophy moved and about the relationship between Scotland and France that was very much under the influence of the sorts of ideas that I have just been talking about, which are decidedly uh, scotistic ideas. We can think of ourselves as rational beings and we think, you know, what would be best? How should we do, thi do things? How, how should we act? And it's almost as if we are producing an argument. We've got a set of premises. Uh, this, is what we this is what we would need to do in order to produce a certain conclusion. We decide we quite fancy that conclusion. We value it. And so we follow through our argument by by embodying that argument in our actions. So the action is rational. It's, 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 it exists with a certain form, a rational form, which comes from us as arguers. Okay. But Scotus says, hang on a minute. We've got to be careful about this. And the reason is that we do not want to reject our freedom while accepting our rationality. His point is that reason does not exert a causal influence on, on us in the sense that having argued that such and such would be the best thing to do, there is nothing we can do except that. So that the conclusion defines how we're going to behave and there's nothing we can do about it. No. Uh, the line that he takes on action and this is stuff he was talking about to his students in the university of Paris. We can demonstrate this. The line he takes on this is that our freedom consists in our openness to the future. In this sense that in the very moment in which we act and do what we do we could in that moment be doing something else instead. It's not that if the circumstances were different, we could be doing something different. It's that the circumstances being exactly the same, totally unchanged, we could still be doing something different in those circumstances. So that we still had the last moment, we listened to the voice of reason but we can still will contrary. Of course, as reasonable, reasonable beings, we will still in general act in a reasonable sort of way. This kind of move that uh, Duns Scotus was making in the University of Oxford and then onward into the University of Paris was carried forward by, uh, by other philosophers 
Um, <coughs> this was part of these ideas, are all part of his scotism. It's as if there is a kind of shadowy world that we carry with us into the future that consists not just of the world as it is because we've made it as it is, but we are carrying with us also our conception of the world as it would have been if we had done something else, which was also in our power to do. So when we are acting as we do, we are also aware of alternatives, and it's especially because we know of these alternatives as within our power that we have the, the sense of freedom uh, that we have. This is carried forward by Scots in Scotland and in, in France. And the reason in those early days, in the days of Scotus, what, why was he there? Well, of course, it was a great university, but it was a time at uh, the end of the 13th century, the very start of the 14th, before universities were being established in Scotland itself. The first of the Scottish universities, 1411, uh, is the University of St. Andrews. Uh, the University of St. Andrews, I've got to say, is, is characteristically a little bit vague about when it, when it was founded. And with a huge anniversary coming up um, <coughs> uh, just a few years ago, it, it, it announced uh, that it was founded between... 1411 and 1413, and this meant that it, w it was entitled, morally entitled, to a funding drive that lasted for three years to celebrate, um, to celebrate that particular 600th anniversary, or whatever it was, of the founding of the university from 1411 to 1413. How long it takes to get born, I've got no idea, but I think claiming three years is really exceptional, but not untypical of St. Andrews that otherwise I find a delightful place to be. <coughs> My stepmother teaches there. Uh, no, enough of that frivolity. Um, <coughs> not long after the founding of St. Andrews, we have the founding of uh, the University of Glasgow in 1451. And in 1495, we then have the founding of King's College Aberdeen, which is the basis of um, of Aberdeen University, and then three universities then. Uh, if I could say, as an aside, it was these universities were immediately full of Scottish students. They were arriving around about the age of 11. The, um, <coughs> all the teaching was done in Latin. And these kids were arriving in university, age 11, 11 able to understand this. Uh, we are supposed to have been a poor, very poor, ignorant country at the time. And the question is, where were these, these kids learning Latin? And the answer is, they were going to school. What schools? Nobody had ever thought to ask that question until very recently. But it's, it's important for the, for the speed with which, with which the universities in Scotland grew. By the end of the 16th century, while um, England still laboured under the uh, disadvantage of having only two universities, Scotland had five. It's really impressive. So they were, learning, uh, they were learning in schools. Where were these schools? Who were teaching? A colleague of mine in the, in the Department of History, late uh, Dr. John, I should say Dr. 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 John Durkin, because he had three doctorates. Um, <coughs> he, he went looking for medieval schools in Scotland, and he started to find them. He was looking where nobody else had thought to look. And by the time he died, he find, found over a thousand Scottish schoolmasters. That's really very impressive for these extremely early days, but it surely explains how it was possible for the kids to arrive at a university in Scotland. Well, I should say there were also many, as well as the Scots who were studying, the students studying at a very early age in Scottish universities, there were loads also in, the universi in universities across Northern Europe and indeed in Italy and in, and in um, Spain as well. Uh, in fact, they had an extraordinary presence and in the professoriate, which was kind of dominated by Scots in Paris in the early years, uh, the decades I should say, 
of the 16th century, where you found people like John Mayer, who went on to be uh, the principal of the University of Glasgow before becoming, in due course, the provost of St. Salvatius College in the University of St. Andrews. He taught for about 30 years in the University of Paris, where he had a huge reputation as the prince of philosophers and theologians. He had around him uh, a gathering of, of uh, Scots, many of whom had been his students, but who went on to become professors and uh, regents in arts in the, uni in the University of, uh, of Paris. People like uh, George Lockett, who, uh, from, the, from Air, who uh, went on to be the dean of uh, Glasgow University. William Manderson, who uh, went on, who was, um, who went on to be a rector, who had been rector of uh, the Sorbonne, and went on to be a rector of the uh, University of, of, um, of St. Andrews. Um, Will, uh, uh, Gilbert Crabbe, who went from Paris eventually to Bordeaux, having written commentaries on Aristotle's um, uh, politics. And, and there were a whole lot of them. Scots, very distinguished teacher, teaching in Paris, uh, going on to other universities in France, and there were also, and there were also, some of them who came back to Scotland, and they were also teaching Scottish, Scottish students, and uh, uh, there was a, a very distinct Scottistic uh, frame to their to their teaching. Uh, several of them, indeed, a number of them, when they wrote about Scotus, didn't call him uh, Scotus. They didn't even call him Doctor Subtilis, the subtle doctor, which was his honorific title in the Middle Ages. They called him Conterranus, my fellow countryman, or my, my compatriot. Uh, they thought of him as one of ours, one of our boys that made it, as it were, really, really went, went to, uh, to the top. And there, in some of their writings, there is, as, as for example in Mayers, where there's quite a lot of biographical detail about uh, Scotus, who was born not very many miles from where John Mayer was, just outside Haddington. Um, there's clearly great uh, national pride in this, in this great uh, Don Scotus. The, the people I've been talking about so far, you are, by the way, I've decided, getting the three-hour version of if I can't stop, it'll go longer. <laughs> when my voice gives out. Sorry, Ramona. Can't be helped. You, you just live with it. You know that. Um, th th these were men of the old order, the Catholic order. And all the ones that I've mentioned would have died for the Catholic old order. But come the Reformation, the universities of Scotland moved into a new order. It was dramatically different right across Scotland. And the universities had to change as Scotland itself changed to accommodate itself. And the universities of Scotland came under the authority of new documents of formation. They were Protestant and they were, became rather, in due course, Presbyterian uh, Protestant. Reformed orthodoxy was the name of the game. And of course, philosophy had to change as a result of that. And in light of the question, how is philosophy going to sound? How has it got to sound? if it speaks with a Protestant voice, and especially if it speaks with a Presbyterian voice. Is that the same philosophical voice as you hear from the heart of Catholicism? Th through the Western philosophical tradition, religion, I want to say, have done in the past, religion has provided the space within which philosophy has flourished. And what this means is not that religion or ecclesiastical institutions have dictated what philosophers have to say. 
heaven forfend, that should happen. What religion has done is, in many respects, dictate the agenda for inquiry, which is a totally different matter. Here, along come religious people, and they, they produce certain dogmas, and the question is, what on earth are these people talking about? Can you make sense of it? Probably not. But if you can make sense of it, have you got a shred of justification for believing it? So there are problems immediately raised of a most fundamental nature within religion of both a semantic nature regarding the sense of what religion stands for and of re for uh, demonstrating the validity or the truth of what it is that religion stands for. Of course, we are talking about times when religion permeated the lives of individuals much more than it does, let's say, in Western Europe today. There are very few places which are widespread, deeply, deeply religious. I'm suddenly reminded of something I mentioned to two dear friends yesterday evening over dinner. Both of them are here. It, it concerns a Pope, um, John Paul II, who was giving a mass to two million people in, uh, in Mexico, poor Mexico. I don't mean on account of the Pope, I mean on account of the latest uh, tra natural uh, tragedy. And he be began his uh, talk by saying that he had been informed by the church authorities um, <coughs> that 98% of the population of Mexico believed in God, but 100% believed in Our Lady of Guadalupe. Now, I can believe this, but I've got to say that all in all, this makes Mexico very exceptional. I mean, you couldn't say anything like that of Scotland today, or indeed of, uh, of England today, so that what we have to say is that in these two countries, and I gather it's fairly well the story across Northern Europe, religion does not permeate the lives of ordinary individuals the way it did even half a century ago, never mind uh, much earlier. But for philosophers through all these centuries, um, in substantial measure, it was religion that was dictating the agenda, as I said, for inquiry. So when a, a reformation comes, a religious revolution, then uh, um, philosophy has got to reconsider uh, its position. Now, let me say, um, this what I'm saying is incredibly relevant to relations between Scotland and France at the philosophical level. Two things I want to say there. <coughs> We've got to consider the old order and we've got to consider the new. First of all, Scotland became overwhelmingly a Protestant country and in a very small space of time. Even if it's not true that Scotland suddenly became Protestant in 1560, which is the usual story, the Protestant revolution um, rolled over, over Scotland very quickly indeed. And suddenly, instead of the old order being on the front foot, it was on the back foot, it was in trouble. Um, the lives of the Catholic community, suddenly a small minority, um, became uh, much more precarious. And many left, as a matter of fact. And uh, many went to France, which being, by, with a large majority, a, a Catholic country, they could feel much at home and much safer. And of course, uh, many of them went into the church, and so you duly find students arriving, um, almost, a, well, really as refugees or exiles from Scotland, arriving in um, French universities and in seminaries such as Douai, which had a significant majority of Scottish students. On the other side, you've got the uh, Reformed Orthodox uh, universities in Scotland, the ones that gradually came under the influence of Geneva, under the influence of uh, Calvin in particular, although of course there were a number of, of others, although Calvin is 
Calvin's is the name that one now especially uh, invokes. And there were these many reformed Orthodox folk in France, and they needed pastors for their new church, for their new churches, for the new communities. Somebody had to um, form, provide formation for the, the pastors in the, uh, in the new academies that were being set up uh, in places uh, like uh, Saumur and uh, Montauban and D and Orange and so on. And where were these pastors? Uh, who were going to teach these uh, uh, young students uh, to become pastors in Reformed Orthodox? And the interesting thing is that the, the, the academies were set up very much according to Genevan models, and the theologians in Geneva trusted the Scots doctrinally. The outcome is that in all of the Reformed Orthodox academies, the Huguenot academies uh, in France, you find Scots as teachers coming in particular straight from the Scottish universities where there had previously been students. And Glasgow was amongst the universities that provided these teachers. Um, I think of the, the boys, Robert Boyd, um, and I think uh, of uh, Zachary Boyd, who were very distinguished people. One was a principal, went on to become principal in the University of Glasgow, but they were teaching the French students, the reformed French students. So you find a significant, um, a significant presence of Scots on both sides of the religious divide uh, in France in the latter part, at the end of the 16th century, let's say, and through the 17th century until, 1680, until 1685, uh, when we have the, um, <coughs> the when the, the treaty of, uh, when the Edict of Nantes, is it not the Edict of Nantes is announced, and the uh, Huguenot population, the Reformed Orthodox population in France, uh, suddenly loses more or less all its citizens' rights, and many of them leave France. Indeed, they leave by the hundred thousand in order to escape persecution. So there we've got um, there we've got the the very strong influence of Scotland. Uh, in, in France, both sides of the religious divide for that period of uh, uh, getting on for a century. Um, uh, it's about it, isn't it? I think. Well, um, mm, I, I've just been given permission to talk for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, uh, philosophical question, what kinds of things were they be, were these students being taught? And the point is that S Scotus goes marching on on both sides of the religious divide. Okay, you would think that it, it, he might continue casting his shadow on the Catholic side of the divide, but come the, come the Reformation, come the Scots arriving in France on both sides and as teachers and professors, you find that Scotus goes marching on, even there. Um, I don't want to say anything very much, anything indeed, about the, the Catholic, well, not much about the, the Catholic side here, because uh, I'm, I'm actually going to be giving a talk tomorrow afternoon, even if it's con continuous with this one. I'm going to be giving a talk tomorrow afternoon on some of the things that were going on vis-a-vis -vis the Scottish Catholic presence as teacher uh, in France uh, uh, across the 17th century. But just to mention there, even there, 
Um, what I was saying about the whole idea of freedom is, hi there, I've not seen you for ages. Uh, uh, what I was saying about, about freedom um, is, is something that's still found. So we still have the idea of openness, openness to opposites, or openness to contraries, wondering what to do, and aware of ourselves as able to make a difference, all the difference to the future, because we have power on both sides. We can either do something or we can do the opposite, and there's an entire spectrum. And we can reason our way to, uh, to a decision, so this is what we'll do. But even there, you, there's still a, a moment, and we can say yes or no to the voice of reason, and we can reject it what, and do something that's just mad. And you would say, well, you know, you can't, how can you possibly think about doing something mad? Here you've got all these reasons for not doing something. Of course you're not going to do it. And the answer is, that to say that is to make a ghastly mistake about human nature. Uh, we all of us do things that are utterly and completely mad. And we don't just do such things, we do them knowing that they're mad and it doesn't stop us. So um, although we may be very, we may be rational beings in the sense that we've got a faculty of reason and we can demonstrate that we do, do indeed deploy our rationality, that doesn't stop us working against this highly valued, m treasured faculty of reason that we've got. And that's, that's a wonderful definition of freedom. So that was a concept of freedom that was being taught. Um, and here I'm speaking in particular of somebody I'll be talking about at greater length tomorrow, who um, <coughs> became, in due course, a Jesuit priest and went on saying these things after he'd become an, an oratorian, uh, having previously been uh, a theology student in the Scots, co in, in the Scots College in Rome, uh, and before going on to the seminary in Douai. And indeed, wherever he landed, he, w he was amongst Scots, surrounded by Scots indeed, to such an extent that it really looks as if he attempted to carve out a career for himself in France as far as possible at a distance from the French and in close proximity uh, to, to Scots. And he was another one, by the way, who keeps referring to, um, to Duns Scotus as Contaradius rather than rather boringly as Duns, Duns Scotus. If I can continue this um, beyond the 17th century, this scotistic story, I look just for a moment at the common sense school of philosophy uh, that really defines Scottish philosophy in the 18th century, even if one of the two greatest one of the three greatest Scottish philosophers of the 18th century was David Hume, who is thought by many people, possibly wrongly, to have been hostile uh, to, the, to uh, common sense. Um, what I have in mind here is Thomas Reid, who takes up exactly the argument that I have previously been quoting, first of all in, in uh, Duns Scotus, and then, by the way, you find it in Mayer's, in the circle of John Mayer, the, the group around John Mayer, and then you find it being taught both in seminaries in, um, in France and also in the Huguenot academies in France. It's now reappearing in the, in the Scottish universities that are taught by the common sense philosophers of Scotland where a question is raised about common sense and what is the appropriate model to use? And they make a cunning move. You're wondering what to do. You argue on one side, this is a good idea, we should be doing this, and then you think, no, we shouldn't. So an argument on the other side. Th this kind of argument that goes on in the head of all of us when we are wondering how to behave is awfully like the dispute that can take place 
in a court of law. Okay? The, the, an advocate for a position uh, for the defense, and then one, an advocate for the, prop for, for the prosecution, each one defending, that they are defending uh, alternative, alternative positions, and both of them have to show that their own view is really the more rational of the two. Who's going to win? Well, you might say whoever's got the stronger argument. But hang on a minute. How do you decide which is the stronger argument? And you might say, if you're feeling tired, uh, that the stronger argument is the one that dictates what you actually do. So that it's an empirical question. The stronger argument is the one that wins. But please to note that that is a tautology. And the, and the point is, it may be indefensible. There are, some, there are occasions when the stronger argument may not win. Go back to the discussion uh, I, ha I had a moment before about what can go on in a court of law. You've got somebody for the defense, somebody for the prosecution, and each of them is arguing that their own side is more reasonable than the other side. And who wins? Which of the advocates for the position wins? And the answer is, that question is not decided by the advocates. There's a judge who listens to both sides, and the judge will decide whether the prisoner, whether the person in the dock, the one charged, uh, goes free or um, goes to prison. And the judge, let's face it, might get it wrong. So he listens to a very strong argument, and he listens to a, a very weak argument, and he's an idiot. And he thinks, ah, this weak argument, this is really strong. I'm, I'm going to go with this one. And so somebody who's just uh, committed three murders uh, is, is set free. So that's the point. The faculty of will which actually decides is not the faculty of reason that produces the arguments on one side or on the other side. Now, this is all set out in great detail by, um, by Thomas Reed, the leader of the S School of Scottish Common Sense. Okay. Now, in due course, in, in 1840, I think it was 1846, but I may be out by a year. I think it was 1840. The collected works of Thomas Reed um, were published. They were published by somebody called Hamilton, Sir William Hamilton, who was a professor in Edinburgh. And the first page is very interesting. It's the dedication page. It is dedicated to the Minister for Public Education in France, Victor Cousin. And you really do wonder what was going on. Uh, in the 1790s, a young man named Pierre Paul Royer Collard was wandering past, you know, these bouquinistes on the, um, <coughs> uh, beside the Seine in the Latin Quarter. Um, he came across, he was wandering along and he saw a book and he came across the book, started, started to read it and said, ah, I have just discovered the new French philosophy. Royer Collard uh, had just found um, a translation of Thomas Reed's first masterpiece that had been translated into French in sometime in, in the late 1760s. Uh, I think it was maybe been published in Amsterdam or Rotterdam or somewhere. Um, anyway, he studied at the Sorbonne, rose to be a professor there, and taught this stuff very briefly. Among his pupils was Victor Cousin, 
who read Thomas Reeve, was completely bowled over, and um, Victor Cousin rose to become professor, and he, in due course, um, <coughs> taught all this material, taught the Scottish common sense philosophy. And he was followed uh, by Théodore Jouffroy in that same, in that same post. And he taught the Scottish, uh, the Scottish philosophy of common sense. So right through the 19th century, that Scottish philosophy was being taught. It was very difficult in a, in a French course in, uh, of philosophy to avoid what the Scots had been teaching, which included, by the way, all the things that I've just been talking about vis-a-vis -vis the uh, philosophy of uh, freedom and, and the will. And um, I, w I, I would say, uh, as an honest man, my case here rests, so it's all right, remember, uh, my case rests, I think I've demonstrated uh, beyond any doubt whatsoever uh, that uh, Scotland played a huge part in the development of philosophy in France. Thank you very much.